Hello everyone, I'm Kathleen Pally. Welcome to this special omnibus edition of Journey with Story. And in this special omnibus episode, you can listen to all five stories for this month, one after the other. And just so you know, there will be no special intro for the individual stories, no added details and no shout-outs. If you want to hear all of those, then you need to go and listen to the individual episode and not this version. Got it? Oh, mums and dads and grown-ups, you can download some free colouring sheets at www.journeywithstory.com. A big thank you to all of you who wrote reviews for my new picture book, Five Little Angels. And congratulations to all the winners of our contests. Be sure and check out our Instagram page to see a list of our winners and the fun prizes that they won. And don't worry if you didn't win a prize this time. We will be having some fun summertime contests for podcast-related prizes too. Let's take an omnibus journey with story. Let's take a journey with Coyote's Broken Dream. One day after Hare finished a marvellous meal, he sprawled out on the ground, basking in the warm sunshine, and closed his eyes. Soon he fell fast asleep. While Hare was snoring contentedly, along came Coyote, who smacked his lips and grinned to see sleeping Hare. What a fine feast he would make, and with one leap, Coyote sprung up and landed plop on Hare's back. Eow! Hare cried, bolting awake. Ha ha! Coyote giggled. I've got you. You feel quite fat and mm, what a tasty meal you'll make. But Hare was a quick thinker. Yes, he answered, looking innocently up into Coyote's eyes. Yes, I'm nice and full and I don't mind if you eat me. After all, I'm only a wrinkled, tired, scrawny, measly, dry old Hare. Besides, I'm sure I don't have much longer to live. Hare sighed sadly and then clasped his paws together in prayer. Oh, just one favour, Coyote. Please let me live long enough to ring the school bell today. What are you talking about? Now, even though Coyote was wily, he was still easily confused. Well, said Hare, eyeing the tree above them, you see the sweet young juicy hares are all in school today and it's my job to ring the bell when the school day is done. When I ring the bell, they know it's time to hop right home. So if you'll let me live just long enough to ring the bell, I'll have finished all I have to do in this world. Coyote cocked his head. This sounded interesting. When you ring the bell, he asked, what exactly happens? He longed to know where all those tender young hares might go after old hare rang the bell. Oh, they'll come running past here, of course, hare said. But you see, coyote, I must wait until just the right time. The hares mustn't leave school until the sun reaches the top of this tree. He pointed up right to the top of the high branch, where there was a big hornet's nest hidden among the leaves. Brother Hare, Coyote said, why don't we ring the bell now? Oh, no, no, we can't do that, Hare said. I only hope I will be able to climb to the bell when the time comes. You see, it's up there at the top of this tree. Coyote looked up and his stomach began to rumble and growl. You said those little hares were nice and tender. Oh, the sweetest, juiciest things you've ever seen, Hare said. How tasty they would be for someone like you. Luckily they're safe in school and won't come out until I ring the bell. Otherwise you might try to eat them. Oh, not me, Coyote said. I respect little ones, but, Brother Hare, you must be feeling terribly stiff. Why don't I let you up to stretch a while? Hare grinned. 
Now that would be so nice of you, Coyote. I won't go away, of course. I must stay here until it's time to ring the bell. Of course. Coyote smiled and he stood up and set hair free. Hair stretched and sighed. And as he did, Coyote began to imagine all those tender young hairs. You know, Coyote said, if you'd like to run around a while, I could stay and ring the bell for you. How nice it would be to have one last run, Hare said. But of course you have to promise you won't ring the bell until the sun has reached the top of that tree. Coyote nodded. Oh, no problem, he said. It's a very simple job, really, Hare said. All you have to do is shake the bell, but you must shake it hard to make sure the little hares can hear it. I can do that, Coyote said proudly. You just go run along. And that's exactly what Hare did. He ran away as fast as he could, and when he was safely atop a nearby pile of rocks, he turned and called, Don't forget to ring that bell, Coyote! As soon as Hare was out of sight, Coyote rushed to the tree and began to shake it with all of his might. At last, he heard no ringing bell. And so he shook it still harder. He shook and shook and shook until at last the hornet's nest fell from the tree and landed right at his feet. The moment that happened, the air was filled with furious hornets. And when they saw the creature who had ruined their slumber, they flew at him, stinging and biting him and chasing him across the desert. Coyote ran as fast as he could, howling and yelping and calling here all sorts of nasty names, and he vowed he would never again let that sly creature outwit him. Oh no, not wily Coyote. He would find that hare and catch him, and never again would he believe a word of hare's tales. Let's take a journey with The Tale of Samuel Whiskers by Beatrix Potter. Once upon a time, there was an old cat called Mrs. Tabitha Twitchit, who was an anxious parent. She used to lose her kittens continually, and whenever they were lost, they were always in mischief. On baking day, she determined to shut them up in a cupboard. She caught Moppet and Mittens, but she could not find Tom. Mrs Tabitha went up and down all over the house, meowing for Tom Kitten. She looked in the pantry under the staircase, and she searched the best spare bedroom that was all covered up with dust sheets. She went right upstairs and looked into the attics, but she could not find him anywhere. It was an old, old house full of cupboards and passages. Some of the walls were four feet thick, and there used to be strange noises inside them, as if there might be a little secret staircase. Certainly, there were odd little jagged doorways in the wainscot, and things disappeared at night, especially cheese and bacon. Mrs Tabitha became more and more distracted and meowed dreadfully. While their mother was searching the house, Moppet and Mittens had got into mischief. The cupboard door was not locked, so they pushed it open and came out. They went straight to the dough, which was set to rise in a pan before the fire. They patted it with their little soft paws. Shall we make dear little muffins? said Mittens to Moppet. But just at that moment, somebody knocked at the front door. And Moppet jumped into the flour barrel in a fright. Mittens ran away to the dairy and hid in an empty jar on the stone shelf where the milk pans stand. The visitor was a neighbour, Mrs Ribby. She had called to borrow some yeast. That's what people use to make flour rise when they're making bread. 
Mrs. Tabitha came downstairs, meowing dreadfully. Oh, come in, Cousin Ribby, come in and sit ye down. I'm in sad trouble, Cousin Ribby, said Tabitha, shedding tears. I've lost my dear son, Thomas. I'm afraid the rats have got him. She wiped her eyes with her apron. He's a bad kitten, Cousin Tabitha. He made a cat's cradle of my best bonnet last time I came to tea. Where have you looked for him? Oh, all over the house. The rats are too many for me. What a thing it is to have an unruly family, said Mrs. Tabitha Twitchit. I'm not afraid of rats. I will help you to find him and whip him too. What is all that soot in the fender? Oh, the chimney wants sweeping. Oh, dear me, Cousin Ribby, now Muppet and Mittens are gone. They have both got out of the cupboard. Ribby and Tabitha set to work to search the house thoroughly again. They poked under the beds with Ribby's umbrella and they rummaged in cupboards. They even fetched a candle and looked inside a clothes chest in one of the attics. They could not find anything, but once they heard a door bang and somebody scuttered downstairs. Oh, yes, it is infested with rats, said Tabitha tearfully. I caught seven young ones out of one hole in the back kitchen, and we had them for dinner last Saturday. And once I saw the old father rat, an enormous old rat, Cousin Ribby. I was just going to jump upon him when he showed his yellow teeth at me and whisked down the hole. The rats get upon my nerves, Cousin Ribby, said Tabitha. Ribby and Tabitha searched and searched. They both heard a curious or roly-poly noise under the attic floor. But there was nothing to be seen. They returned to the kitchen. Here's one of your kittens at least, said Ribby, dragging Moppet out of the flower barrel. They shook the flower off her and set her down on the kitchen floor. She seemed to be in a terrible fright. Oh, mother, mother, said Moppet. There's been an old woman rat in the kitchen and she's stolen some of the dough. The two cats ran to look at the dough pan and sure enough, there were marks of little scratching fingers and a lump of dough was gone. Which way did she go, Moppet? But Moppet had been much too frightened to peep out of the barrel again. Ribby and Tabitha took her with them to keep her safely inside while they went on with their search. They went into the dairy the first thing they found was mittens hiding in an empty jar. They tipped up the jar and she scrambled out. Oh, mother, mother, said Mittens. There has been an old man rat in the dairy. A dreadful, enormous, big rat, mother, and he's stolen a pat of butter and the rolling pin. Ribby and Tabitha looked at one another. A rolling pin and butter? Oh, my poor son, Thomas, exclaimed Tabitha, wringing her paws. A rolling pin, said a Ribby. Did we not hear a roly-poly noise in the attic while we were looking into that chest? Ribby and Tabitha rushed upstairs again. Sure enough, the roly-poly noise was still going on quite distinctly under the attic floor. This is serious, Cousin Tabitha, said Ribby. We must send for John Joyner at once, with a saw. Now... This is what had been happening to Tom Kitten, and it shows how very unwise it is to go up a chimney in a very old house where a person does not know his way and where there are enormous rats. Tom Kitten did not want to be shut up in a cupboard, when he saw that his mother was going to bake, he decided to hide. He looked about for a nice convenient place and he fixed upon the chimney. The fire had only just been lit and it was not hot, but there was a white chalky smoke from the green sticks. Tom Kitten got up upon the fender and looked up. It was a big old-fashioned fireplace. The chimney itself was wide enough inside for a man to stand up and walk about, so there was plenty of room for a little tomcat. He jumped right up into the fireplace, balancing himself upon the iron bar where the kettle hangs. Tom Kitten took another big jump off the bar and landed on a ledge high up inside the chimney, knocking down some soot into the fender. Tom Kitten coughed and choked with the smoke, and he could hear the sticks beginning to crackle and burn in the fireplace down below. He made up his mind to climb right to the top and get out on the slates and try to catch sparrows. 
I cannot go back. If I slipped, I might fall in the fire and singe my beautiful tail and my little blue jacket. The chimney was a very big old-fashioned one. It was built in the days when people burnt logs of wood upon the hearth. The chimney stack stood up above the roof like a little stone tower and the daylight shone down from the top under the slanting slates that kept out of the rain. Tom Kitten was getting very frightened. He climbed up and up and up. Then he waded sideways through inches of soot. He was like a little chimney sweep himself. It was most confusing in the dark. One flue, that's a part of the chimney, seemed to lead into another. There was less smoke, but Tom Kitten felt quite lost. He scrambled up and up, but before he reached the chimney top, he came to a place where somebody had loosened a stone in the wall. There were some mutton bones lying about. This seems funny, said Tom Kitten. Who has been gnawing bones up here in the chimney? Oh, I wish I had never come, and what a funny smell. It is something like mouse, only dreadfully strong. It makes me sneeze. <laughs> said Tom Kitten. He squeezed through the hole in the wall and dragged himself along a most uncomfortably tight passage where there was scarcely any light. He groped his way carefully for several yards. He was at the back of the skirting board in the attic where there is a little mark in the picture. All at once, he fell head over heels in the dark down a hole and landed on a heap of very dirty rags. <laughs> When Tom Kitten picked himself up and looked about him, he found himself in a place that he had never seen before, although he had lived all his life in the house. It was a very small, stuffy, fusty room with boards and rafters and cobwebs and plaster. Opposite to him, as far away as he could sit, was an enormous... A rat. Do you mean by tumbling into my bed all covered with smuts? Said the rat, chattering his teeth. Oh, please, sir, the chimney wants sweeping, said poor Tom Kitten. Anna Maria, Anna Maria, squeaked the rat. There was a pattering noise and an old woman rat poked her head round a rafter. All in a minute she rushed upon Tom Kitten and before he knew what was happening... His coat was pulled off and he was rolled up in a bundle and tied with string in very hard knots. Anna Maria did the tying. The old rat watched her and took snuff when she had finished. They both sat staring at him with their mouths open. Anna Maria, said the old man rat, whose name was Samuel Whiskers. Anna Maria, make me a kitten dumpling or roly-poly pudding for my dinner. It requires dough and a pat of butter and a rolling pin said Anna Maria, considering Tom Kitten with her head on one side. No, said Samuel Whiskers. Make it properly, Anna Maria, with breadcrumbs. Oh, nonsense, butter and dough, replied Anna Maria. The two rats consulted together for a few minutes and then went away. Samuel Whiskers got through a hole in the wainscot and went boldly down the front staircase to the dairy to get the butter. He did not meet anybody. He made a second journey for the rolling pin. He pushed it in front of him with his paws, like a brewer's man trundling a battle. He could hear Ribby and Tabitha talking, but they were busy lighting the candle to look into the chest. They did not see him. Anna Maria went down by way of the skirting board and a window shutter to the kitchen to seal the dough. She borrowed a small saucer and scooped up the dough with her paws. She did not notice Moppet. While Tom Kitten was left alone under the floor of the attic, he wriggled about and tried to meow for help. But his mouth was full of soot and cobwebs, and he was tied up in such very tight knots, he couldn't make anybody hear him. Except a spider, which came out of a crack in the ceiling and examined the knots critically from a safe distance. It was a judge of knots, because it had a habit of tying up unfortunate blue bottles... It did not offer to help him. Tom Kitten wriggled and squirmed until he was quite exhausted. 
Presently, the rats came back and set to work to make him into a dumpling. First, they smeared him with butter and then they rolled him in the dough. Will not this string be very indigestible, Anna Maria? inquired Samuel Whiskers. Anna Maria said she thought that it was of no consequence, but she wished that Tom Kitten would hold his head still as it disarranged the pastry. She laid hold of his ears. Tom Kitten bit and spat and meowed and wriggled, and the rolling pin went roly-poly, roly-poly, roly-poly. The cats each held an end. His tail is sticking out! You did not fetch enough dough, Anna Maria! I fetched as much as I could carry, replied Anna Maria. I do not think so, said Samuel Whiskers, pausing to take a look at Tom Kitten. I do not think it will be a good pudding. It smells silly. Anna Maria was about to argue the point when all at once there began to be other sounds up above, the rasping noise of a saw and the noise of a little dog scratching and yelping. The rats dropped the rolling pin and listened attentively. We are discovered and interrupted, Anna Maria. Let us collect our property and other people's and depart at once. I fear that we shall be obliged to leave this pudding. But I am persuaded that the knots would have proved indigestible, whatever you may urge to the country. Come away at once and help me to tie up some mutton bones in a counterpane, said Anna Maria. I have got half a smoked ham hidden in the chimney. So it happened that by the time John Joyner had got the plank up, there was nobody under the floor except the rolling pin and Tom Kitten in a very dirty dumpling. But there was a strong smell of rats, and John Joyner spent the rest of the morning sniffing and whining and wagging his tail and going round and round with his head in the hole like a gimlet. A gimlet is a sharp tool for boring holes. Then he nailed the plank down again and put his tools in his bag and came downstairs. The cat family had quite recovered. They invited him to stay to dinner. The dumpling had been peeled off Tom Kitten and made separately into a bag pudding with currants in it to hide the smuts. They had been obliged to put Tom Kitten into a hot bath to get the butter off. John Joyner smelt the pudding, but he regretted that he had not time to stay to dinner because he had just finished making a wheelbarrow for... Miss Potter, and she had ordered two hen coops. And when I was going to the post late in the afternoon, I looked up the lane from the corner and I saw Mr Samuel Whiskers and his wife on the run, with big bundles on a little wheelbarrow, which looked very like mine. They were just turning in at the gate to the barn of Farmer Potatoes. Samuel Whiskers was puffing and out of breath. Anna Maria was still arguing in shrill tones. She seemed to know her way, and she seemed to have a quantity of luggage. I am sure I never gave her leave to borrow my wheelbarrow. They went into the barn and hauled their parcels with a bit of string to the top of the haymow. After that, there were no more rats for a long time at Tabitha Twitches. As for Farmer Potatoes, he has been driven nearly distracted. There are rats and rats and rats in his barn. They eat up the chicken food and steal the oats and bran and make holes in the meal bags. And they all descended from Mr. and Mrs. Samuel Whiskers, children and grandchildren and great-great-grandchildren. There is no end to them. Muppet and Mittens have grown up into very good rat catchers. They go out rat catching in the village and they find plenty of employment. They charge so much a dozen and earn their living very comfortably. They hang up the rat's tails in a row on the barn door to show how many they have caught, dozens and dozens of them. But Tom Kitten has always been afraid of a rat. He never dares face anything that is bigger than... A mouse. (laughs) 
Let's take a journey with The Wise Mama Goose by Charlotte B. Herr. Mama Goose was trying to think. She had left the barnyard because it was so noisy there that she could not collect her wits and had hidden herself between the rows of tall red hollyhocks which border one side of the garden. Here, at least, it was quiet. Thinking had always been hard work for Mama Goose, and besides, her family kept her so busy that she had no time for it anyway. There was always something to be done for the babies, for Mama Goose had a whole dozen of the dearest little goslings, and she was very proud of them. They were soft and round and fluffy like little yellow balls, and besides being prettier than any other babies in the barnyard, they were so bright too, and knew as much as any gosling could be expected to know, far more than little red hen's chicks, even though she did make such a fuss about them. The goslings could hunt for their breakfast almost as well as their mother, while little red hen had to scratch up everything her children ate, and as for the water, well, the chicks were simply not in it there. They did not like to be in the water at all, but the goslings loved their morning bath in the brook better than anything else in the whole day. Yes, her goslings were by far the finer babies. Mama Goose swelled with pride when she thought of it and carefully smoothed her feathers. She could have been perfectly happy except for just one thing. She was afraid that before long something dreadful might happen to the goslings, and once more she settled herself to think. There was something wrong in the barnyard. What could it be that came each night when everyone was sound asleep? And what was it that carried one of the chickens away each time so that when the next morning came, there was always one less than there had been the day before? Whatever it was made no noise. Only, always the next morning, someone was missing, and usually it was a little baby chick that was gone. The worst of it was that no one else knew any more about it than she did. To be sure, little Bantam Rooster had said it was the hawk, but then Bantam Rooster always thought he knew everything and was almost always wrong, so that nobody ever believed anything he said. Besides, if it had been, the big white cockerel would have known it, for the big white cockerel knew everything. He was the king of the barnyard and took care of them all. He had a bright red comb and beautiful long green tail feathers, and Mamma Goose thought him the most wonderful being in the whole world. But something seemed to be wrong with him too. He did not crow half so often as he used to, and his beautiful red comb did not stand stiff and straight any more. It drooped to one side, and he looked very tired and very unhappy, as if he too had been trying to think. But if he did not know what it was that came night after night, then nobody knew. Everything had been very different when old Fido lived in his little house by the barnyard gate. Nothing had ever happened to trouble them then. But old Fido was gone now and nobody knew about that either. One morning after breakfast he had trotted off behind the wagon and nobody had seen him since. Everyone liked old Fido the dog and they all missed him but he had never come back and his little house stood empty all night long. Some thought that he had gone to take care of the sheep who lived in the big field on the other side of the hill, but it was only little Bantam Rooster who said so. Nobody knew. Things had been better, though, before Fido went away, for he had always stayed awake all night and watched to see that no harm came to any of them. Suddenly, Mamma Goose had a thought, and a very bright idea it was, too. She would stay awake all night herself and watch and see with her own eyes what it was that carried away the little chicks. As soon as she had made this plan, she stopped thinking, for it was such hard work and the sun was getting very hot on her poor head. Besides, the goslings had been in the water long enough. They never did know when to come out. So she waddled down to the brook to get them. Then they all went for a walk in the meadow where the red clover tops gnawed in the wind and Mamma Goose did no more thinking that day. 
But when night came, she did not forget her plan. As soon as the sun had gone down behind the hill, the chickens all perched themselves along the roost with a big white cockerel at the end of the row, and soon they were all fast asleep. Little Red Hen gathered her chicks under her wing to keep them cosy and warm, and then she too went to sleep. Mamma Goose tucked her babies in also and spread her wings wide over them all, but she did not go to sleep. Instead, she kept both eyes wide open and stared straight at the big white cockerel that she might not go to sleep without knowing it. It was very hard to sit so long in the dark and keep awake. First one eye, and then the other would close tight, but Mamma Goose would stretch them wide open again and stare harder than ever at the big cockerel, and then she saw that the cockerel was watching too, and that made it much easier. Then it happened, after a long time, when the moon had climbed high above the trees and everything was very quiet, that a long, slim fox stole softly beneath the fence and came creep creep creeping across the barnyard. Mama Goose was so frightened that she almost said quack quack out loud but still she kept her eyes on the big white cockerel and that was a great help. The fox was creep creep creeping softly toward the roost where the chickens slept in a row but not straight toward it. He was keeping as far away from old Fido's doghouse as he possibly could Although she was so frightened, Mama Goose wondered why. She'd always heard that the fox was afraid of old Fido. But didn't he know that Fido was far away? Didn't he know that his little house was empty? He did not take the fox long, however, to creep softly past it. And in the morning, another little chick was gone. But a new thought had come to Mama Goose. If the fox would not go near old Fido's house, then he could not find the goslings if they hid inside. It seemed to Mama Goose the only thing to do, and a very sensible plan indeed. She would ask all the chickens to come in too, and then they would all be safe. But when she went the next day to her best friends and told them about her plan, most of them only made fun of her and all of them turned their backs on her. No one would listen. But Mama Goose was not to be talked out of it. If the others wished to sit still and let the fox carry them away one at a time, that was one thing. But for her to do nothing to keep her little gosling safe, that was quite another So that very evening when the sun had gone down behind the hill and the chickens had perched themselves on the roost with the big cockerel at the end, Mama Goose led all the little goslings into Fido's house. Everyone laughed when she went in, but Mama Goose had made up her mind and she kept straight on as if she had not heard them. But the big white cockerel, he did not laugh at her. So every night, Mama Goose led her babies into Fido's house and every morning brought them out again safe and whole. But always, a little chick was missing. Then, one night, when the sun was sinking low, the big white cockerel flew up to the top of the fence and crowed. All the chickens listened then, while he told them that they were every one to go into old Fido's house that night with Mama Goose, for that was the only way to keep the fox from carrying them all away. Now, when the big cockerel said that they were to do anything, it was always done and no words about it. So that night, all the chickens went into Fido's house. It was all they could do to get in, for the house was not large, and some of them were not polite and pushed against the others to make more room. But the big cockerel did all he could to keep them in order, and at last all the little chicks went to sleep. But the next morning, when the farmer's boy came to scatter the corn for breakfast, he looked at the empty roost and did not know what to think. By and by, however, he found them, and at first he only laughed. But after he had seen that no little chick was missing, he looked as if he were thinking too. And that evening, when the sun had gone down behind the hill, the farmer's boy came back. And who do you think was with him? Old Fido, wagging his tail and looking as if he were very glad to get back. The big white cockerel and all the chickens were just as glad as he was, for now they knew that the fox would never come any more. Mama Goose too was just as glad as the rest, for now she knew that she would never need to bother herself to think about the goslings again. 
but she didn't dream that anything more could happen and she was too much surprised to think about anything at all when old Fido came trotting straight up to her and wagged his tail just for her alone and told her how glad he was that she had been wise enough to use his house and had taken such good care of the chickens while he was gone and what a sensible little goose he thought she was. You might almost have knocked Mama Goose over with one of her own feathers. She couldn't imagine who told them. But perhaps it was the big white cockerel. Let's take our journey with Why the Burro Lives with the Man Long ago there lived a burro called Benito who lived in a place where there was only sagebrush and cactus to eat. Sometimes Benito complained Ee-haw! Ee-haw! Oh, I wish I could live somewhere that has green grass to graze upon and cool water to drink. I don't like this sandy desert. But even though he complained, Benito did not try to leave this mesa because here, at least, he was safe from mountain lion. And he knew mountain lion would never come to such a place that had so little water to drink. One day, Tired of eating only cactus and sagebrush and of being afraid of mountain lion, Benito pranced around the mesa and said, If I ever meet mountain lion again, I will not be afraid of him. I will turn my backside toward him and with my hind legs I will kick him all over this mesa. And with those bold words, Benito galloped around and around kicking every sagebrush bush in sight. Now, just as Benito had finished a flurry of big kicks, he thought he heard something behind him. And as he turned, he saw Don Coyote. Buenos dias, Signor Benito. Good day, said Don Coyote. I am very pleased to see you are enjoying your new home on the Mesa. Why did you sneak up behind me? asked Benito. I thought you were mountain lion. Have you no respect for others that you sneak up behind them and frighten them? Oh, amigo, friend, said Don Coyote. Are you not glad to see your dear friend? Yes, no? I know you too well, Don Coyote. What is it you want from me? asked Benito. Well, amigo Benito. Oh, just this morning I was speaking of you when I met Mountain Lion. And he said, do you know where Benito is? I am looking for him. In my mind, I thought, well, there are only two places where Benito can be, here or there. And since he is not here, Benito must be there. Now, where could there be but over there on the mesa? So I decided to pay you a visit and see if you were there, and you are. You are here on the mesa. Did you tell Mountain Lion where you were going to look for me? asked Benito. No said Coyote, but he wants me to tell him where you are. You mean varmint, Don Coyote, you would tell the lion where to find me? You deserve to be kicked. Benito turned to kick Coyote with his hind legs when Coyote said, Oh, amigo, you are wrong. I did not tell Mountain Lion where to find you. I came here to tell you that Mountain Lion was looking for you, not to show Mountain Lion where to find you. 
Hmm. I don't know whether to believe you or not, Don Coyote. You are a sly one. How would you like to live where it is safe from mountain lion? asked Don Coyote. In a place that is large with green pastures and much cool water to drink. Where would that be? asked Benito. At the foot of those hills below the mesa, he answered, pointing over the cliff to the green pastures below. That is where the man lives. The man is the only creature mountain lion fears. He will be safe there. I know about the man, said Benito. The animals that live behind his fence must work for him. He gives them green pastures and much cool water to drink, but they are not free. The fence keeps them from going where they want to go. But the fence keeps mountain lion from eating the animals, said Don Coyote. Why do you care what happens to me if I am safe, asked Benito. Amigo, amigo, when I think of vicious mountain lion and the harmless animals he attacks, I am always concerned for the safety of one as good as you. Is that all that concerns you? asked Benito. Well, amigo, there is just one other little thing. I hear the chickens that are kept behind the man's fence. I hear them clucking and squawking and crowing, saying that they want to be free. They even scratch along the fence trying to dig a way to get out. I would just like to set the chickens and the roosters free from behind the fence. I have tried to set them free many, many, many times, but the men will not let them go, said Don Coyote, close to tears now. Benito, amigo, Benito, I could lead you to the man's land, to a place where you will always be safe from mountain lion, a place where the grass is always green and the water is always cool. When we get you there, you could jump the fence and kick a hole in it with your strong hind legs. Through the hole, you could pass the chickens out to me so that I can set them free. I will help you and you will help me free those nice plump, I mean, I mean, those poor chickens wanting to be free. Benito looked at Don Coyote. Don Coyote looked at Benito with a pleading look in his eye. Don Coyote, I am an honest burro. You just want me to help you steal those chickens from the man. This is how you repay me by suspecting me of wanting to steal the chickens? You deserve to be eaten by mountain lion, scoffed Don Coyote. Get off my mesa, Don Coyote. And with those words, Benito turned around and kicked Coyote with his strong hind legs. He kicked so hard that Don Coyote flew through the air over the cliff and landed below on a cactus bush. Don Coyote scrambled up and ran away as fast as his coyote legs would carry him. He yelled back to Benito, Now I will tell Mandalay where to find you! Hee-haw, hee-haw, laughed Benito as he set off on a trot to the man's green pasture. He jumped the fence and asked the man if he could stay behind the fence where the grass was green, the water was cool, and the mountain lion could not get in. The man agreed, but said that he would have to work for his keep, and so to this day the burro works for the man in exchange for green grass and cool water. And whenever Burro hears a coyote coming near the chickens, you can hear it. Hee-hoy, hee-hoy, and kicking out its hind legs. Let's take a journey with 
the woman who wanted more noise. Once upon a time, there was a woman who lived in the city. She had lived there all her life and she loved the sounds of the city. The streetcars, the big trucks and the buses that rumbled by. She loved the sounds of the people as they hustled and bustled along the busy streets and trundled in and out of the stores. One day, the woman received a letter in the mail from her cousin who lived in the countryside. Her cousin wrote, I am moving to Australia. You are welcome to come and live in my farm in the country. The city woman thought the farm would be a fine place to live, and so she moved from her home in the city to her cousin's place in the countryside. As soon as she arrived at the farm, the woman was delighted with all that she saw. The acres of land around the house, the beautiful apple orchard, a sturdy red barn, and a spacious lush garden. But there was one problem. The woman found that try as she might, she could not go to sleep at night. It was far too quiet, and she missed all the sounds of the city. So she went to visit her neighbour, who lived not far away in another farm. What can I do to get some noise in my farm? I can't sleep at night because it's too quiet. You need to buy some animals for your farm. That will make some noise for you, said the neighbour. So the old woman hurried off to buy a cow. She brought the cow home and put her in the red barn. And sure enough, the cow soon began to moo loudly. But it was not enough for the city woman. So she went out and bought a dog. And she put the dog out in the yard and fed him. And soon enough, the dog began to bark, making a very loud noise. But it was still not enough for the woman. So off she went and bought a cat. And she put the cat in her house so that she could hear her loud meowing. But it was still not enough noise for her. So off she went and bought some ducks. And she put them in the pond beside her garden. And those ducks splished and sploshed and made a loud quack, 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 quack. But it was still not enough. So the woman went out and bought hens, a rooster and some little chickens and she put them all in a coop next to the barn and they crowed and clucked and squawked, making quite a racket. But it was still not enough. So the woman went out and bought a pig and she brought it home, putting it out beside the sturdy red barn near a big trough filled with slops and water. And that pig grunted and snorted and snuffled to its heart's delight. But it was still not enough. The woman could not go to sleep at night because it was too quiet. So then she had an idea. She would buy an old broken down car with a loud horn. And that is just what she did. She brought the car home and drove it all around the farm, blowing the horn as loud as she could. It made a wonderful loud noise, and so whenever the woman felt things were too quiet, she would go out to the car and honk that horn. All the animals would join in with their mooing and their clucking and their crowing and their grunting and their barking and their meowing, and together they all made a huge uproar. But... It was still not enough to satisfy the woman. Every night she missed the sounds of the city and could not fall asleep. She tried to figure out what other sounds from the city she was missing. What could possibly make her happy again in the country? And suddenly it hit her. Of course, she needed to hear the sound of... Children. So she went into the city and she found some children who agreed to come and visit her farm. Lots and lots of them came and they ran outside to play with squeals of joy and peals of laughter. They made a very fine noise and all the animals joined in with their mooing and their clucking and their crowing and their quacking and their barking and their meowing and their grunting. And then the woman blew the car and horn. Now it was not quiet. It was not quiet at all. It was noisy. Very, very noisy. 
And the woman was overjoyed because now, at last, she had enough noise. She loved the farm and could go to sleep at night, listening to all the beautiful sounds of the country. I hope you enjoyed that special omnibus edition of Journey with Story. And if you're looking for some ideas for further follow-up activities, maybe you can discuss what the story souvenir was for each story. Remember, the story souvenir is just that little glimmer of truth about what it means to be human and live in this world. Maybe you can make a drawing of your favourite episode and send it to me on Instagram at Journey with Story or on our website. Oh, and another activity that a lot of mums have shared with me their kids like to do is after listening to an episode a few times, children like to act it out. So you could get your brothers or your sisters or your friends together and put on a little play for your mums and dads to lighten their day. Oh, and mums and dads, you can get some other ideas for activities and storytelling resources from me if you sign up for my newsletter at www.journeywithstory.com. And if you subscribe to our Patreon page, you can enjoy even more perks and resources. Here's to stories aplenty that fill our hearts with grace and goodness, hope and light, so that we remember, as my favourite poet says, All shall be well. All shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. Be well, my friends, be well, and join me next time for Journey with Story. Music and post-production was by Colette Jonas.